Hello there, friends, and welcome to another episode of Fables of Four. Now, if you don't know what Fables of Four is, Fables of Four is a free audiobook series where I take the D&D characters that I've played, put them in the D&D world that I run, and throw them through a variety of mysteries and challenges for your entertainment. As always, uh, things are going to be different this episode as I'm trying to find my groove, and I think today's set of episodes, rather, are more along the lines of what I want this series to look like. So, I hope you enjoy. Let's roll up the nerdy stuff and get into the videos. Today's region is... 12. Nainan. This region is a desolate marshland continuously shrouded in fog, littered with the ruins of a mysterious kingdom no nations have records for. Today's plot is... 10. A tall, handsome man in fine clothes stands in the center of a crossroads. He seems to know each of the player characters' names and says he has information that would be very valuable to them if they choose to return to this spot tonight when the moon is at its apex. Today's characters are... 7. Phaedra Rosenquist Oh, a kin? Phaedra is a pale-skinned, elf girl with short blonde hair in buns and green-brown heterochromia. She is short and muscular, wearing fishing and traveling clothes. 2. Cross Exumen Here we go! Cross is a brown-skinned human boy with spiked brown hair and gray eyes. He is muscular and of average height, wearing casual clothes under a thick breastplate. 12. Trixie Star. Ooh, good choice. Trixie is a young, pink-skinned tiefling woman with white hair and green eyes. She is slightly tall and curvaceous, wearing a heart-themed leotard. 2. Automatic. Quinn Breezily. Oh, didn't I just go last time? Quinn is a blue-skinned Air Genasi woman with long, curly white hair and purple eyes. She is of average height and build, wearing a vibrant circus outfit and striped socks. Now let's discover the Man of the Mists. Phaedra quietly picks through the pile of gleaming jewels, glamorous swords, and creepy dolls. Behind her, the boat hovers gently in the marsh river. Trixie is sitting on a cushion on top of a dry rock, filing her nails. Cross stomps around angrily, kicking the marshy ground every now and then. You're a freaking butt face, dude! And you're stupid. So is your hair. What's stupid is that you won't let me look at the cool haunted stuff of Phaedra. Because Phaedra's 40 and you're like 12. Am not! Listen, twerp. Either you shut up and let her do her thing, or we're not going to Meleshador. No! I want to see the volcanoes! You said we would after this. I said we would after the Chord Cathedral Grand Opening tonight. Don't worry, you'll love it. There will be lots of wrestling and macho stuff for you, and like, candy, I think. <laughs> what, what, what type of candy? You're pathetic. Ugh, I should have went with Clarabelle. Yeah, you should have, but you didn't. So now you're stuck here with me. Close your mouth and be a good boy, or you're walking to Meleshador by yourself. Cross waits until Trixie's back is turned and makes a face at her. Phaedra lets out a surprised noise and holds up a skeleton arm, whose fingers are still greedily clasped around a glowing sapphire. Phyractory? Trixie frowns. Mm, no, babe. I don't think that's it. Phaedra immediately puts it down and picks up a cracked glass dome fastened to a gold plate. Trapped inside is an opalescent feather, long and delicate, suspended midair and spasming violently. Phyractory? 
I thought Clarabelle said it was supposed to be a box. Maybe look for like a treasure chest or something. Phaedra tosses the glass dome aside and oddly, it doesn't shatter. The next thing she picks up is a large golden medal, pleasantly warm with the icon of a meat pie grafted onto it. It smells of freshly baked pie crust. She glances at Trixie, who is pinning her with a green eye. No, drop it. But, but what if it tastes good? This is the pit of the accursed, Phaedra. People dump a bunch of totally haunted crap here all the time. Put it down. I don't want you to get, like, demon mono or something. Phaedra, now grief-stricken, tosses the metal back into the pile. As she wades through the cursed valuables and Trixie inspects her nails, Cross hears a faint squelch in the muddy hill behind him. He turns, and emerging from the ever-present fog, is a strange woman in strange clothes and very muddy socks. Yo, yo, who's there? Trixie and Phaedra turn to see the guest as well. Hello, hello, yes, I am Quinn. Are you all, by any chance, Phaedra and her group? The trio look at one another, bewildered. Who's asking? It's the silliest thing. I was walking to the marsh, when suddenly I spotted this man. Very friendly bloke, quite handsome. And he waved me over. Trixie perks up. Handsome? Yes, it's the jaw and the eyes, really. He asked me what I'm doing out here. I tell him, and then we chat a little bit about botany. Then, just as I was getting started, he waved over this other adventuring group. And now he's asking me to get you. I think he wants some sort of conference. Sounds fun. Let's do it. Another adventuring party? Do they have... Uh... Cross takes a quick look at his degree requirements. Do they have any... Uh, strong-looking swordsmen? That might also be demons or vampires? Well, I don't know about vampires, but they do have two swordsmen. And one of them is a tiefling, if that counts. Eh, that should be fine. Lead the way! Cross and Trixie head over to Quinn. Phaedra seems a little intimidated by the prospect of new people and wants to pick through the pile more. But since she was asked for by name, she follows too, curious and reluctant. A group of five waits at the top of the hill. There are two individuals carrying swords on their hips, as promised, alongside a figure in a starry coat, a man in fine clothing, and a young woman with a drum on her travel pack. A thrill of recognition jets up Phaedra's back, and she steals a series of uncertain glances at the young woman with the drum. She is a shorter human, with fair skin, long red hair, and gray eyes. Along with a pair of muddy boots, she has on a corset, a clean shirt dress, and riding trousers. Golden hoops dangle from her ears. She spots Phaedra and gives her a friendly wave, which the elf returns with less shyness than before. Ah yes, I figured you two would be happy to see one another again. The man speaking is a tall, handsome, half-elf man, tan and well-built with gray pants and high black boots. His dark, silver-streaked hair droops down the shoulders of his tunic, whose front has been left undone. There is an easiness to his demeanor and an exotic comfort in his smiling blue eyes. Before that, you there! Cross points at the red, round-cheeked tiefling with tiny horns poking up from her brown hair. She is wearing a short cape, leather armor, and a breastplate, with a sword on one hip and a tattered shield on the other. Oh? Yes? Me? You any good with that sword? Fun question. Why do you ask? I'm Cross Eximen, and I have to defeat a master swordsman and a demon in order to become a Bladeworks Grandmaster. I'm here to take out two stones with one bird. That sounds fun. I can spar you. Sure. But I think this man will want to talk to us first. 
The other swordsman of the group, a stout halfling man with blonde sideburns and silver ear piercings, shoots Cross a dirty look. The tattoo spiraling down his arm pulses a faint green once, and his brown eyes do the same. Despite having no armor or shield, he puts a hand on his own sword. Don't get the wrong idea about us either. We're not your friends. Let's not jump to conclusions. Perhaps you can all be friends, should you humor me with but a few minutes of your time. I'm willing to give you as much time as you need. I'm Trixie, by the way. She puts out a hand for a shake, but he takes it and kisses the back. Mm. <laughs> a pleasure, Trixie. I am Teplesoft. Nice name. So, Teplesoft, how did you know my name earlier? I'm still a little freaked out about that. I know all your names. That is one of my many abilities. <laughs> like hell you do. Teplesoft gives the swordsman a patronizing smile. Of your group, Raced, we have Bria, your musician, Freely, your caster, and, as I have already mentioned, Esphere. This second group is comprised of Phaedra, Cross, and the lovely Trixie. Quen here was just a passerby until a few moments ago. The final figure of the opposing group, a tall individual in wizard robes seemingly spun from the night sky itself, gives a curious frown. They have raven black hair and caramel skin, with a translucent crystal feather tucked behind one ear. Their black eyes, rimmed with blue mascara, are full of confusion. I thought this region was supposed to be barely inhabited. The fact that there are so many of us here makes me think you gathered us for something. Perhaps I have. Perhaps it was fate. All I wish to do is give you one simple thing. Information. The various groups look at one another. Information? Information. You've certainly caught my interest, but information is rarely free. I've learned that much. What is your price? There is a small cost. Waiting. You return here when the moon is at its apex. Only then will I have enough arcane power to tell you of your futures. Ooh, fortune teller. How cool! W you can see the future? W will I ever become a Bladeworks Grandmaster? Or get any taller? <laughs> will you ever shut up? I can do more than see the future. I can give you relevant and helpful information. All I need is the light of the moon to fuel me. Oh, sorry. As much as I'd like to stick around and have you teach me a few things, my group and I will need to leave soon. We've got something super important to be at tonight. But maybe after, if you're still here, I can swing by. Ah, but Trixie, the grand opening of the Cord Cathedral is one of the central reasons I want to talk to you. There's a big secret around the whole thing that you ought to know. <laughs> secret? Don't be shy, you can share. All in due time. And all you want is to tell us information, nothing else. Teblesoft frowns. Not exactly. I will need your help freely, privately, with a tricky and rather embarrassing arcane problem. It's about transmutative integrals, if you're familiar. I suppose you should consider the information I give you in return as payment. It would be rather challenging, however, so if you cannot help, that is understandable. The wizard smirks. Problems typically just need a fresh set of eyes, I've learned. Sure, I'll give it a look for you. Transmutation is my forte, in fact. And, if you need private help with anything else, Teplesoft, let me know after, okay? Yes, I can think of a few things I could use your assistance with as well. Is it okay to set up camp here and wait? Bria's eyes widen as she turns to face Esphere. Oh no. No, 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 no. I do not want to spend a single moment longer in this godforsaken swamp. We're gonna camp down and just sit here? For longer? Bria, come on, it will be fun! We can make new friends, and you will learn your future tonight! Take a chill pill, Bree. We've only been here for like a day, and you're already making a fuss. It's a marsh, by the way, not a swamp. Well, actually, since you don't know the specifics, it could be a bog, so wetlands would be the better term, thank you. Raced rolls his eyes. Regardless, you will find the area quite agreeable. 
and time should pass rather quickly, enjoying the company of others. After my brief time with your friends, I will head off to prepare for tonight's events. It is worth the wait. I hope you all choose to stay until the end. Freely. The man looks at the wizard, they share a nod, and then head towards the hovering fog, lowly discussing arcane theory. Bria frowns and takes a step after them. Freely, darling, do you really think it wise to offer help on a problem you know nothing about to a man who knows frighteningly too much? I can think of a few examples of people obsessed with the moon who wouldn't have our best interest in heart. Deposoft lets out a warm chuckle. <laughs> Natural 20. It would be unwise for me to go alone with an arcane master such as Freely and attempt to hurt them. And of course, should anything happen to them, I have you lot to worry about. Fear not, Bria. I am not one for harming, only helping. Of course, of course, forgive me. My suspicion is due more in part to discomfort than anything else. I can recognize we're in capable hands. And just how do we know that exactly? Just because you think he's hot doesn't make him trustworthy. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, the sensitivity of my issue has made me ansier than usual. Uh, what might I do to set you all at ease? Do not worry, Teppelstoff. You are a person we can trust, and we like helping people. Raced is just being raised. What is that supposed to mean? As fear gives him a reprimanding look, and he blushes, glancing away. Fine. Just don't be an idiot, Fweely. That's always the plan. The wizard follows the handsome man into the fog resuming their discussion about arcane theory, as fear waves as they recede. Next time on Fables of Four. Phaedra, check out that weird pool over there. Did he die? Blimey, you look terrible. Do you need some healing? Who is responsible for this? It didn't just happen on its own. Teplesoft, he charmed me. Me too. Please, Bria, you're the only one who can hear this, because... I knew we shouldn't have trusted you. How charming. The mystery continues.